In the beginning, there was nothing. But around 3000 BC, the origins of finance began to take root. Since then, in the world of finance, only a few number of investors have enjoyed the test of time. Through unwavering discipline, grit, and lots of hard work, they made lucrative returns where others bleed. They sought alpha, where others don't even dare to look. When the herd goes one direction, they embark on the road not taken. They bet against the financial markets and won. In this episode, I introduce to you the $3 billion South African titan, Sir Patrice Mutsipe. Patrice Mutsipe was born to Hosi Mutsipe, a school teacher who later became a small business owner. Therefore, it is hard to miss that his father influenced the trajectory of young Mutsipe's later success as he too grew up to be both educated and entrepreneurial just like his father. When Patrice was merely a baby ape, around the age of 8, he would wake up at 5 a.m. so he could help run his father's spaza shop from 6 in the morning until 8 o'clock at night. It's important to note that most of the customers were mine workers, giving Mutsipe first-hand exposure to the mining industry. More on this later. He picked up valuable business skills such as selling, marketing, basic accounting and finance. It is here, in the small spaza shop, that Patrice built the foundation to what would become a strong business acumen, which turned him into a shark. However, life was not easy. Growing up amidst the apartheid regime, African people within South Africa were constant victims of discrimination, physical abuse, and racism from an all-powerful white supremacist and Hitler-supporting government. Apartheid, which means apartments, was a government that believed in the segregation of different people according to their race, with African people at the bottom of the hierarchy. Opportunities were scarce, and education, although endorsed by Christian missionaries, was limited. In fact, Here's a clip of Trevor's grandmother explaining the only opportunities a black man had in Mzansi during those days. He was just like our God wow. on earth. Really. Because people had not seen a black man who was an attorney. We were not allowed. Wow. Nursing. Mm. Teaching. Mm. Policemen for a black man. That's all. So it was a wonder even for Umadiba. For young people, it's very hard for them to understand how scary it was to be a black person living in South Africa during that time. But everybody was scared of the police. Flying squads. Uh. It can ever still get a flying squad. Mm -hmm. The knock at 3 a.m. My police, we used to call them black jacks. Go go somewhere. Just like that. Dress up, let's go. Yeah and they were so tall, all of them. When you see white guys like this, do they remind you of those police? There are many ways to skin a cat. However, some ways are more guaranteed than others. According to multiple sources, roughly 76% of all billionaires have bachelor's degrees. The stat becomes worse when you look at millionaires. Patrice himself knew that on his rise to power, money, and influence, he would need a solid degree that would open up doors to rooms that he previously not have access to. And that's exactly what happened. Patrice pursued a BA degree at the University of Swaziland and obtained his LLB degree from the University of Vets where he specialized in mining and business law. He used this degree to get into the most prestigious law firm in South Africa, Bowman Kilfelen, now simply known as Bowman's. This is a big five commercial law firm with its headquarters in Santon, specializing in legal commercial services in areas such as mergers and acquisitions, aka deal making, debt and capital markets, and private equity just to name a few. At this point, Patrice is young, smart, ambitious, and some would say megalomaniacal. So after serving as an apprentice, Mutsipe quickly climbed the corporate ladder such that in 1994, only at the age of 32, Patrice was already a partner, being the first black man in the firm to accomplish such a lofty feat. This was the same year Nelson Mandela became the first black president of South Africa. So things were good. He had a good salary, a high position, a beautiful wife, all the things which a normal man can aspire for. But for Patches, this was not enough. See, Patches is not like other men. He is a silverback, a megalomaniac, a gigachad, an alpha. So what do megalomaniac, silverback, gigachad alphas do when placed in such a position? <laughs> You're right. Like Jeff Bezos and Charlie Munger, he quit. That's right. He quit his secure, relatively high-paying job three years after making partner to pursue entrepreneurship endeavors just like his father. 
Remember when I said it's important to note that most of the customers in his father's spaza shop were mine workers, which gave Mutsipa first an exposure to the mining industry when he was only eight years old. Yes, it's now 27 years later. He now has two degrees, experience, and networks, all the tools he needs to found his baby, African Rainbow Minerals. However, Things were not all sunshine and rainbows. Mutsipa was unable to secure a loan, so he had to run his new company literally out of his briefcase. Times were tough. No offices, no fancy headquarters, no coffee, no board meetings. Just him, his intellect and work ethic. As they say in Latin, Aurantes fortuna juvet. Fortune favors the bold. Thus, in 1997, with gold prices at a low. He purchased marginal gold mines from Anglo Gold for $7.7 .7 million, which were financed by a loan agreement with Anglo, in which Petrus will only pay them back from future earnings from ARM. By 1999, he had teamed up with two of his associates to form Green and Partners Investments, where he would repeat a string of deals in which Mutsipe would buy operating mines, use his expertise to turn them into highly profitable entities, and then repeat the process over and over again. These were lucrative bets, because from his experience as a legal professional, Patrick knew two things, that gold would go back up so he is investing at distressed prices, and secondly, he knew cheaper alternatives of extracting minerals from the ground which would cut costs and widen profit margins. The year is 2002, and this is the day that most founders dream of, the IPO, an initial public offering. This is when a company sells its shares to the public for the first time. In his book, Retire Young, Retire Rich, Robert Kiyosaki makes the argument that most billionaires don't become so by buying shares low and selling them high, which is the traditional route taken by most people on their road to power, wealth and success. Robert argues that one must merely sell shares. Think Mark Zuckerberg, Bill Gates, Jeff Bezos, Elon Musk. All these people formed a company, gave themselves a portion of the company for free and sold the remaining portion to the public. As the demand increases for these shares, so does the value of the shares that they gave to themselves for free, hence printing money from thin air, making them rich. Patches was no exception. In 2002, African Rainbow Minerals listed on the Johannesburg Stock Exchange. Cash flush from the proceeds received from the listing, they set out to expand aggressively. Patches grew ARM into a leading non-diversified mining and minerals company with strategic investments in platinum, iron, coal, and gold mines. As of 2008, ARM had a 60 billion rand market cap, giving Patches a cool $1.2 billion net worth, making him the first South African billionaire in dollars. This is still not enough for the billionaire titan. He has another problem on his hand. How does he spend his billions? Well, he spends it by doing what other silverbacks from the billionaire boys club do such as Mark Cuban and Steve Cohen. He buys a sports club such as Mamelodi Sundowns and then buys another one such as the Blue Bulls. But secondly, and the bigger question is, how does he preserve or grow his wealth? He does both. How? I introduce to you the three pillar investment strategy. Number one, create a hedge fund like entity. I say like because unlike a hedge fund where they take risky bets to maximize profits, the objective here is to diversify and protect wealth by acquiring significant shareholdings in various entities. In the words of Grant Cardone, take concentrated risks to amass fortune, then protect your fortune through diversification. This is why Mutsipe started African Rainbow Capital, to diversify his wealth from purely having its base in the mining industry only. Number 2. Set up a venture capital and private equity-like fund in which you invest in high-growth emerging startups, particularly in the tech industry. The idea here is to discover potential moonshot companies or what's typically referred to in finance as unicorns. These are extremely risky bets where you invest in let's say 10 companies for example with the hope that maybe 3 of them will succeed so much that it offsets the losses from the other 7 companies and make you extremely high profits. Imagine investing in Apple, Facebook or Tesla in the early stages. Chances are these companies grew so much in value that even if you had 9 losing possessions, if you just had one of these, you'd probably still come out with an overall great profit. Mutsipa demonstrates this by investing in telecommunications when he bought Rain, which gave many South Africans access to Wi-Fi, and he's also deeply invested in digital banking through his holdings in Time Bank. Number 3. Hold Cash 
When a crisis emerges, the most logical thing to do is to profit from it. That's how billionaires are made. While most people stress about the stock market going down, rich people see it as an opportunity to get in and ride the wave when it goes back up. So always have enough cash to take advantage of opportunities when they come your way. Today, Patrice has a cool net worth of $3 billion. For perspective, that's the same as Warren Buffett's right-hand man, Charlie Munger, who once said in a talk that's more money than he knows what to do with. Besides hard work and unwavering discipline, I'd just like to point out that one of the things that made this man incredibly successful is his open-mindedness. The way he thinks are not typical of an African man born in the 60s. While most African men his age made their fortunes in corruption and stealing from the average working man and woman, Mutipe engages in forward-looking initiatives such as investments in digital banks, internet, and also philanthropic endeavors such as the Giving Pledge, becoming the first African to even do so. From nothing, to something, to everything. And that wraps it up. This is the story of how a baby ape rose the ranks and entered the billionaire boys club. From a young Chad to a giga Chad. This has been the $3 billion South African Titan, Sir Patrice Mutsipe. I love you guys. See you on the next one. Peace.